ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to you from here at the Cathedral of St John the Divine in New York City for tonight's concert, part of our Great Music in a Great Space series. Tonight, a selection of pieces devoted entirely to probably the greatest composer ever to have written for the organ, Johann Sebastian Bach. Before we get on to talk a little bit about the music itself, I've got a couple of pre-flight check details for you about a couple of non-musical items. Point number one is that uh, very soon you'll notice that in the cathedral we have uh, parked at the front of the cathedral nave something called a high lift. It's absolutely enormous and uh, it comes once every year because the city of New York had to do uh, um, an in-depth um, survey of all the very, very high vaulting of the cathedral and uh, that just happens to coincide, coincide with tonight's filming. Uh, so that's just a little bit of a heads up on that. And the second thing is uh, for many of you who are regular visitors to our YouTube and Facebook channel, uh, you'll notice that the morning of the concert I became the recipient of um, a rather over-enthusiastic hairdresser. Uh, I decided it was time to go to the barbers and um, I think I was probably his first cut of the day. It was 3 p.m. and uh, so he just went for it and um, I said to him I'd not had my hair cut for two months uh, but I'm not quite sure that he understood what I said and um, by the time he started with this electronic razor it was all too late so it's a little bit severe and uh, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a warning bit of a heads up on it that it's not my normal style. I often think what J.S. Bach would have thought of New York City. What would he have thought of the subway, the skyscrapers, and the whole concept of the multicultural melting pot? What would he have thought of the huge emphasis on commercialism and profit? We do know that he didn't travel that much compared to many of his fellow composers. Probably the expectation to write a brand new cantata for every Sunday of the church's year at the Thomaskirche meant it was simply impossible to be away. I'm sure he must have known about the new world. This map of New York dates from 1730, when Bach was 45. From 2007 until 2012, we lived in Ipswich, Massachusetts, where the house opposite us was built in 1635. That's a full 50 years before Bach. And I wonder if Bach truly recognised that he had such a unique link to his creator and that his music would have such a colossal impact on Western civilization for the next several hundred years. Apparently, he once told a student that if he were to work as hard as he did, he would be at the same level. I'm not so sure. Famously, the young Bach visited Lübeck in 1705, aged just 20. He went to meet the most famous North German organist of the time, Dietrich Buxtehude, Buxtehude was the organist of the Marienkirche and the leading North German composer of the time. Coming from the relatively small Thuringian towns of Eisenach, Ordruf and Arnstadt, Bach must have been really overwhelmed by the incredible size of the Marienkirche. It would have been quite amazing to have witnessed that famous meeting between these two colossal musical giants. Buxtehude was 68 and Bach just 20. What a shame neither of them posted each other's improvisations on Facebook or Instagram. The Marienkirche is 337 feet long. St John the Divine here in New York is almost double that at 601 feet. My hunch is that Bach would have loved the colossal and sacred statement of Big John 
probably be already in negotiations with the Dean about composing a passion or some type of mega cantata appropriate to both the size and the acoustic of the cathedral. I don't doubt that he would have loved the famous pastries over the road at the Hungarian pastry shop and also made regular visits to the neighbouring V&T's southern Italian restaurant, no doubt consuming generous portions of steak and potato, not to mention a glass or three of Chianti Classico. It's clear that the organ held a central position throughout J.S. Bach's life, and contemporaneous accounts from his biographers, such as Johann Nicholas Forkel and Philipp Spitter, cite how he was easily the finest organist of his generation. I'm delighted to present to you this concert tonight, illustrating the huge variety of Bach's compositional output for the instrument including two colossal cornerstones of the repertoire, the Toccata Adagio and Fugue in C, BWV 564, and the Prelude and Fugue in E-flat, BWV 552. Also the incredible six-part Rishika from the musical offering, BWV 1079, and four contrasting chorale preludes, illustrating his huge prowess in always creating something out of the box, even when using pre-existing compositional templates. The ebullient Toccata Adagio in Fugue in C most likely dates from Bach's time as court organist at Weimar between 1710 and 1717, when he was very much influenced by his North German predecessors, most especially Dietrich Buxtehude. It shares many similarities with other Toccatas composed around that time, such as BWV 538 and 540. All show the influence of concerto style and form. The work begins with an extended passage for manuals only, followed by a declamatory pedal solo and a motivic contrapuntal section. Various scholars have noted how the construction of this first movement is reminiscent of that of a concerto, where the opening manual and pedal passages are taken as concertino, in other words, solo instruments, and the closing contrapuntal section as concertato, in other words, full orchestra. The second movement is again in two sections, one marked Adagio and another marked Grave. The insertion of a middle slow movement in an organ work was quite unusual for Bach, although traces of this idea can be found in other works from the same period. For example, an early surviving version of the Prelude and Fugue in C major, BWV 545, contains a slow trio, which was removed from the final version but found its way into one of the late organ trio sonatas, BWV 529. This adagio is a melody made out of short phrases, quite characteristic of early Bach, over what may be seen as a realised continuo part. The music has been compared to Giuseppe Torelli's Concerto in C Major, Opus 8, Number 1, but in Bach's over, this adagio stands alone and has really no parallels. The abundance of Neapolitan sixth and quasi-pizzicato pedal suggests an Italian influence. The adagio flows seamlessly into the short grave section, which, through Italiante Durezzi chromatic progressions, movingly enlarged with several instances of diminished seventh chords suspended over the next chord, leads us back into the tonic. The third movement is a very lively, dance-like four-voice fugue in 6-8. Several features of the fugue suggest that it represented a considerable advance for Bach, especially considering that there are middle entries as far as the mediant and the dominant of the dominant. 
Somewhat unusually for Bach, the fugue includes very few episodes, the longest being the coda of the piece, which is based on various steel brise figures.
That was Bach in his most extrovert, youthful and vibrant mode with the Toccata, Adagio and Fugue in C, BWV 564. The musical offering, BWV 1079, is a collection of keyboard canons and fugues, all based on a single musical theme given to Bach by King Frederick the Great of Prussia, to whom they are dedicated. They were published in September 1747. The Rishikar Assis, a six-voice fugue which is regarded as the high point of the entire work, was described by the musicologist Charles Rosen as the most significant keyboard composition in history. This incredible fugue moves from one to six voices and back with consummate ease. The harmony is both complex and rich in a way that foreshadowed developments of the Romantic era over 100 years later. This arrangement was made by the celebrated former organist of Saint-Eustache, the late Maître Jean Guillou. I must admit that this piece has a certain anecdotal significance for me. On the 8th of March 1994, I had the distinct honour of being invited to give a concert at Notre Dame de Paris, marking the 10th anniversary of the death of the great Pierre Cochereau, who had been the organist of Notre Dame from 1955 until his untimely death in 1984, at the age of only 59. The second piece in the programme was this great six-part Rishikar. It sounded completely off the charts on this wonderful instrument, which I consider to be certainly one of the most exciting in the world. In the concert, things were going quite well, until the beginning of the middle section, when the then new and rather bug-ridden computer software controlling the key action decided to have one of its moments. All within the space of about two bahars, the complete system crashed. Liz, my first wife, thought I'd done a Louis Vierne and collapsed in the middle of a recital, in the same square foot. An announcement was made in fast French, describing a 
grand problème d'informatique avec les grands orgues. We rebooted the complete instrument and started over. Lo and behold, at exactly the same bar, the same thing happened. Fearing that we might end up in the Café Notre Dame for the rest of the evening, I tried one more time, but with the next piece on the programme, the wonderful F minor Prelude and Fugue by Marcel Dupré. From then onwards, everything worked just like clockwork. Everything was a bonus, and it actually completely cured any feeling of nervousness for such a huge occasion. I suspect it was the great Pierre just playing another one of his famous jokes from just behind the veil. I hope you'll enjoy this incredible Richard surely one of the most remarkable amalgamations of Bach's harmonic and contrapuntal genius.
During Bach's lifetime, he was renowned both as a fabulous organist and also as a very important advisor on the building of new as well as the restoration of previously existing instruments. Back in September 2013, I had the wonderful experience of giving a concert at the Wenzelkirche in Naumburg, just a few kilometres southwest of Leipzig. Bach advised the organ builder Zacharias Hildebrandt on the details of the rebuilding of this instrument in about 1745. And the detailed report survives, as does the restaurant bill where Bach imbibed significant amounts of sausages, potatoes, cigars, beer and brandy. The organ was recently restored by the wonderful German firm of Euler. Playing the same keys as Bach had played was a very moving experience indeed. It was a sound world which was rich and very expressive. Bach actually prescribed a famous undulating Undermaris stop on the Oberwerk of this instrument. It's a stop that really foreshadows the developments in romantic organ building over a hundred years later. This, as well as the plethora of very chocolate-like eight-foot stops and the all-important 32-foot Undersatz, which Bach prescribed to give die beste Gravität, show that in organ building as well as in composition, Bach was the archetypal inventor, always pushing creative and artistic boundaries to their absolute limit. There is a wonderful sense of pedagogic continuity in which liturgical organists, particularly in Germany and Holland, are still trained in the art of improvising chorale preludes and not to just simply play the introduction, which is a carbon copy of verse one. This tradition, of course, stems all the way back to Bach and his predecessors. Today, I've chosen four contrasting chorale preludes beginning with Wir glauben all an einem Gott, BWV 740. This is a stunningly beautiful example of the ornamented chorale. It's quite unusual in that the five voices are split, with three in the manuals and two in the pedal. Double pedal presents numerous challenges of coordination for any organist both in terms of putting your feet on the right pieces of wood and also creating a sense of line, which is as expressively vocal as in the manuals. As so often with Bach, here his harmony leads you forward in a completely unpredictable, almost quirky vein. BWV 740 ends with a beautiful and deeply moving melisma probably much in the style in which he might have improvised. Wo soll ich fliehen hin, BWV 694, is a trio with the chorale melody stated in long note values on a solo reed stop in the pedal. The fact that it survived at all is due only to Bach's pupil Kernberger, who collected 24 organ compositions, amongst other works, following his master's death, and almost certainly dates from before 1710. Vater Unser in Himmelreich, BWV 737, survives in two copies, one by Walter, and the other is in Yale, under the alternative title, Nimm von uns Herr du Treuergott, this setting is very sombre, the harmony often unyielding, yet very beautiful, and the tessitura of the organ is quite low, with the chorale singing very elegantly over the top. This setting is written as an alabrev, denoting slow-moving, dense counterpoint throughout. Here I've used the rich registration of the combined fondorg, the foundation stops at 16 8 and 4 foot pitches on the manuals and 32 16 and 8 foot on the pedals. The 
final triumphant choral prelude of this set is Valet Willig Dier Geben, BWV 736. The choral melody dates from 1613 and is originally a funeral hymn, the dying soul's farewell to the false and evil world. Bach ornaments this melody with garlands of fast notes, never obscuring the grandeur of the original tune. Today, it has come to be associated with the hymn All Glory, Lord and Honour, traditionally sung as Palm Sunday congregations recreate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem.
four chorale preludes by J.S. Bach, ending with his magnificent setting of Valet Willig Diergeben, BWV 736. As a 14-year-old, very hopeful organ scholar, the first piece I ever heard in King's College Chapel, Cambridge, was the Prelude and Fugue in E-flat, BWV 552, by J.S. Bach, played by the great Thomas Trotter, who was the organ scholar back in 1978. I'll never forget that moment, especially when the 32-foot double ophicleide thundered out right at the end of the fugue. Bach's Klavier Übung III may have aspired to be more a mass for organ than a collection of related smaller pieces. It opens and closes with what has since been commonly catalogued as the Prelude and Fugue in E-flat major, BWV 552. The three-part prelude follows the triple symbolism of the Holy Trinity, with the Father as a dotted rhythm, Son as a lighter, simpler idea, and the Holy Ghost as the all-encompassing 16th note melody. The five-voice triple fugue is popularly referred to as the St Anne, principally because its subject sounds similar to the hymn tune with that name, sung to the words, O God, our help in ages past. <laughs> 